and her fellow presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, I'm conscious that we're still having beeps of people joining us, but I think, it, as you say, if, if we can kick off, that's really good. So if I can just introduce myself, I'm uh, Jennifer Stockard. Uh, actually, I should start off by saying, can everybody hear me? I'm assuming so, but it, am I coming through all right? Thank you. I've had a couple of thumbs up. Brilliant. So I'm Jennifer Stockard. I'm the head of adult mental health commissioning for Derby and Derbyshire. And I, I would want to just really say what a pleasure it is to be here today, albeit virtually, um, and have that opportunity to share with you all some of the areas that we are working on. I also want to say thank you for everybody joining us. It's a little bit intimidating with the number of people who've signed up and the beeps that we keep getting, but we really do appreciate everybody who's taken the time out of their busy diaries and busy days to um, attend this session. Um, obviously, it's really good that you are um, interested in this and obviously it's great that we're wanting to have a question and answer session at the end where we can have more detailed conversations about some of the things that's going on. Just to say, um, this, is a, this session is a follow up from the discussion that we held last year, which was back in, actually it wasn't last year now, it was back in October 2020. Um, and that session we focused really on the impact of COVID on people's mental health and the changes that we were making to services to support um, to support that in, um, need. Now, obviously, since that session, um, the impact of COVID has stayed with us all, and the emergence of the Omicron variant has, has resulted in you know um, reduced service provision across all organisations because of staff um, absence due to sickness, but also the need to isolate. We've also had further outbreaks on our inpatient wards, and this has resulted in um, us having to arrange for people to receive care out of Derbyshire, um, because obviously we, we know that we need to provide that care and support that people need. As we discussed at the last session, um, we talked about the, the impact of COVID and lockdown, which has had a real negative effect on people's mental health, and especially those with existing mental health issues and people with a learning disability or autism. We also spoke about some of the services that we were putting in place to support people who are feeling overwhelmed and that included the helpline and some of the work that we were doing around, around crisis services and what we wanted to do today was follow up on that actually and share with you some of the details around the developments for crisis services for children, adults and people with a learning disability and autism. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do what Katie's told us all to do not and I'm going to try and share the presentation on my, on my screen so everybody can see it. Now, I think we shared the presentation out with people prior to this meeting, so hopefully you've got the chance to see it all. But um, I would just try and do that now. So just bear with me whilst that's working. Just while Jen's doing that, could I do a reminder, please, just for people to have their microphones off? It, it, it looks like an old 50s style device, and if you, click on it once it will mute it and it just reduces the background noise thank you so i'm sharing my screen now it's taking a while because the amount of people i think that we've got on can you confirm whether you can see that yeah we can see yeah. it jen is it possible to enlarge it at all it's as large as it can be on my screen. Um, my screen's full size. Perfect. Thank you. Is that all right? Wonderful. OK. Um, as you can see, there's not just me presenting, or you'll be very happy to hear that I'm going to hand over to some of my colleagues. What we'll do is we'll introduce ourselves as we start talking, if people are very happy with that, and you, we'll explain the area that we're working on and the work that we're doing. So if this works, wonderful. So. As I just discussed, obviously what we're going to do today is focus on crisis alternative developments and obviously that across adults, children and services for people with a learning disability and autism. Um, I, I just talked through the different um, bits of helpline support that we've got. So obviously we talked in the last uh, presentation around um, the mental health helpline and also what I will do now is hand over to my colleague Jenny Appleby who's going to go into detail around the crisis support services that we have in place 
and the work that's going to go over. Jenny, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yes, thanks, uh, Jen. Hello, everyone. My name's Jenny Appleby, Senior Mental Health Commissioning Manager in Derby and Derbyshire CCG. Just to echo what Jen's saying, really, it's great to see so many people on the call and thanks for your time and interest in this. Um, we hope to give you some good information about some of the things that we're up to. Um, so as Jen says, uh, my specific um, bit that I'm going to talk through is some of the developments around crisis alternatives for adults um, in particular. So um, one of the most significant developments that we've seen in, in recent months and years is uh, hopefully something that you've heard of already. It's the Derbyshire Mental Health Helpline and Support Service. So um, this came about during COVID as a response to um, NHS England's ask for us to ramp up um, this particular service. But I think importantly, it's been built on a lot of uh, partnership working that's happened in Derby and Derbyshire over recent years. So um, just some details about it. It's a free phone um, support service, which is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's, uh, it's for all ages, so children as well as adults, it's response for everyone. And as I say, it's very much a partnership um, between um, Derbyshire Healthcare Foundation Trust, who, uh, who kind of staff that facility, um, as well as P3, who are a voluntary sector organisation, who, um, who've got a number of call handlers as well, and other voluntary sector organisations um, support that. So it's very much a combination of, of effort between um, different NHS bodies, the police, the local authorities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so just to give you a bit of an idea about what you could expect if you were to call that helpline service, um, really importantly, it's, it's a listening ear. So people can, um, can talk through their problems and concerns, whatever they might be. Um, and they might receive some signposting and support to other services, whether they be mental health or more general services um, in the community. And, um, and I suppose importantly as well, um, a decision will be made really as to, as to what the best route is for those needs to be met. So it might be that uh, someone's call is escalated to clinical staff members on the shift and face-to-face -face support might be appropriate for that individual. So it's a real all-round service, just basically. Um, just on to the next slide. Um, thanks, Jen. Uh, I've just included some information there about, just to give you a bit of a flavour of, of how many people have used that service in recent months, to give you a bit of a sense of volume. So roughly between two and 3,000 people are calling that service per month. So, so it is being well used, but one of the things we want to do is just get the message out there to all sections of community just to make sure people are, are aware of this resource. And um, we've had some really, really positive feedback about this service. People have found it you know, really positive, very open access. And again, apologies, it's slightly small on screen, isn't it, this uh, apologies. This just shows that over the recent months, we've managed to avoid um, quite a significant number of um, admissions to the emergency department. Um, so it's it's working, it's functioning well, and uh, yeah, and we're, we're looking to develop it. On the next slide, I've just included some details about how people can access this um, service. So there's the website there with lots of information. Obviously, there's the uh, telephone number, and um, there's also a really good website there, the Derby and Derbyshire Emo Emotional Health and Wellbeing website, which has got lots and lots of information about local support, including. Uh, again, mental health support, voluntary sector support um, across the board. So lots to have a look at there. Um, just moving on to another development that uh, that I wanted to make you aware of, um, which is the safe haven in Derby. So this is a service which, as I say, is based in Derby, but is very much open to adults across Derby and Derbyshire. Sorry, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, and really, uh, the, the objective of this uh, service is, again, is to provide alternative support um, to people uh, with mental health needs as an alternative to A&E primarily. So um, people can access it, uh, for example, if they've called the mental health helpline, there'll be a discussion about how best their needs will be met. And there might be an agreement made that actually the safe haven could be something that could really support them. So it's available out of hours between about the hours of 4.30 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. And it's somewhere that people can go um, in the community. It's run by a voluntary sector organisation called Richmond Fellowship. 
and the kind of support that people could receive there is again it's that listening and it might be about support planning could be about looking at what what things um, people could put in place to help keep them safe for those immediate few hours and also looking longer term so whether they might need mental health or other related services in the future it would be about looking at the needs of, with that person and coming up with a bit of a plan. So um, this has been operational for just over a year now um, and again we've done a service review uh, recently which has showed what we hope to find really that it has um, had some really really good outcomes for the people that have accessed that service. So it has provided a really genuine alternative to A&E for people accessing the service. Um, so we're looking to develop that model uh, potentially to people at, over the age of 16. Currently it's just available to adults. So the next slide, I've just included some quotes just to help to bring it to life a little bit from some of the people that have accessed that service um, who've said, um, for example, the service has been key in helping me save tonight, um, an important service that will undoubtedly save lives. So we've had some really good feedback on that. So. Um, the last development from myself, uh, if we could just move on to the next slide, I just wanted to update people around some of what we're looking at around developing crisis cafes. So this, um, we haven't got these in place as yet, but we're actively working up plans to develop um, a model of support in the community. I'll just explain what we mean by a crisis cafe. Um, we might not call these facilities crisis cafes in the longer term, we're just working through uh, what we've all them just just so that it it's a name that really resonates with people and helps to describe the support available what essentially we mean um, by by this provision is out of hours facilities for people with mental health needs again somewhere for people to go when when there isn't anywhere else to go really to support them um, so that they don't have to access a and e to, to get their mental health needs met so um very much about accessible to everyone, a drop-in facility, so no appointment or referral will be needed. So it's really open and easy for people to access. Um, the kind of support that people might receive from these facilities, I suppose I similar suppose to similar what you described, it's very much about, about preventative, preventative and support, mostly in things like so it's about, about support and all these things, um, maybe some signs, basically. basically. Understanding, Understanding what and working with them. So it will need to be a, a safe space, um, somewhere where people feel happy and comfortable to go, uh, with a variety of needs that will be worked through. So just moving on to the next slide, please. Um, some of the work that we've been doing on this, we've been doing a lot of engagement work with local people over the last uh, few months. So we've done surveys, focus groups, etc. We've attended specific groups and I just wanted to share some of the feedback that we've had. We've had an awful lot of feedback, but uh, the important things that people have said are really about these spaces being very inclusive and very much about going somewhere so they're not alone. And I think really, really importantly, uh, the feedback we've had just really strengthens that view that actually these spaces should be community owned. They should be um, somewhere that that really feels like um, you know there are people within their community supporting them and, and they're really owned by the community. So just in terms of the next steps, if I could just move on to the next slide, please, and kind of where we are um, with the development of these. Um, we are, as as I mentioned, we've done lots of engagement work over recent months. And um, we're also doing quite a lot of mapping work. So by that, I mean, we're looking at the data that will tell us um, where are accessing similar services. And we're looking at where the gaps are. We're looking at my, where there might be similar services because um, we're very much open work with communities, organisations and groups that have got something similar like this already. So it's not necessarily about creating, it's about working with what we've already got out there. And, um, so we're doing some further work uh, with people that might be interested in supporting us to deliver uh, these facilities. Uh, so, for example, we've got a market engagement event just this week, in fact. So interested people who might want to help us to deliver these um, will be attending that just to hear the plans and talk through some of the ideas that they might have in doing this. So it's very much about working with the community to understand uh, how best to deliver this. So. Um, 
I suppose essentially we're hoping that the cafes will be up and running by around summer or autumn of this year very much dependent on uh, what's out there already and how quickly we can we can mobilize this so that's it from me I'm going to hand over now to my colleague uh, Helen O'Higgins thank you very much I do apologize I'm trying to um move the slides forwards but they're a bit sticky so <laughs> you start Helen ah there you go <laughs> Here we go. Thank you, Jen. So hello, everybody. So I'm Helen O'Higgins and I'm head of Children and Young People's Mental Health Commissioning at Derby and Derby CCCG. So I'm going to take you through just a few slides that explain some of the, the work that we're doing with partners around improving the response to children and young people who find themselves in crisis. So as, as you can see, the, the approach that we're taking is that we really want to support those children and young people to um, reduce escalation in, into crisis and the approach that we're looking at is very much taking the child as an individual and um, and however they present whatever their complexity so we're not being siloed with this you know it's very much all, all children in crisis we, we want them to be able to get an offer through this this service so um the some of the other key key areas that we, we're building on as part of the model are that the importance of some of those key relationships for children and in building that positive network around the child is, is really crucial. And what we want to do is ensure that um, it's very much a multi-agency approach. It's, it's something that in, in combination, we can then support that child with all, all the different needs that they may have. And um, you can see that the model that we use across the whole of the children and young people's um, pathways, this around Thrive from Anna Freud. And it's the, the portion that I'm going to be talking about today is very much like getting risk support. It's those children who find themselves at a point where they um, are not currently able to engage in therapy. They're not able to engage in um, in in those services and it is that we are needing to wrap around support to um, to help these children through that crisis to move on jen to the next slide please it'll move slowly so well, so as next what i wanted to discuss is just some of the um the engagement that we have done so far that we, we spent quite a lot of time this this last year trying to understand from our, our partners what what is needed and what that crisis re response needs to look like. There was a, a, there's been a lot of work done prior to the pandemic that we've we've utilised as well and taken that learning and then re refreshed it and um, and looking at how we move it forward um, in the kind of new world that we find ourselves in. So the, the key themes that we are, are looking to incorporate in the, in the approach is we know we need to in, improve and increase some of the support hours available to children at this point. And as I've said, the, the multi-agency response is, is crucial. And some of the things that we're really keen to start to build in is those links into education, but also um, into positive, constructive, purposeful activity for, for children at, at this point to be able to um, help them to cope. Um, we're also looking at risk management is, is crucial through this. And the multi-agency care planning is something that we've we've really been able to progress with um, with a, a strategic complex case manager that uh, role that we've put in recently that is really helping at that very much at that complex crisis end of the pathway to bring agencies together to um, to help us navigate the care of, ch of children to get them to the right place at the right time um, and then another key focus is this reducing inequalities is something that we really need to to understand and ensure that our, the the offer is is one that all our children can access easily move on jen please okay so um a re really important piece of work that um has been been done in the last few months is with the mh2k who are a group of citizen researchers aged between 14 and 25 and they um so an, an organization that they they work together they take the the kind of system question that we gave them and they kind of work work together on focus groups and developing questionnaires to go out to their peers to find out what um 
what what we can do to Im improve the services. So um, just focusing on some of the feedback they gave us, uh, particularly related to um, being able to access the offer. So even though there are elements of the offer in place, um, it was felt that um, some children just did, didn't know what was out there. And um, another key thing is that at the moment, like the 24 seven helpline that, that Jenny has uh, described at the moment, that is a phone phone call access. And as we know, a lot of children and young people, they don't pick up the phone to talk to their friends. You know, they don't pick up their phone to pet talk well to the, talk to their parents it's going to be you know text messaging it's something so we need to be looking at ways to make that support accessible to um to, to this population um so again then some of the areas that um as part of our model that we're particularly looking to invest in um taking the um that feedback on board is um we're really in, in investing in an additional, I think it's 64 posts across Derbyshire in the crisis liaison and intensive home treatment service. And the, the asks nationally and, and, and what we, we know we require is that that's a 24 seven assessment service that we're moving to that links to a, a brief response with them for those children that need it, that intensive home, home treatment. Um, we're also alongside that we're looking to build a, a day offer where, the, um, where where children may be able to access for a bit of respite so you know it's helping might be helping to keep children in their home or in their placement but that they've got some time time away and linking to um, the, the intensive home treatment team as well we're also looking at employing as um, this is additional to the now, as part of those 64 staff that I've just described, there is a, a flexible workforce that we're, we're developing with um, community workers who will be able to move with the child, so support them, um, whether that's in the home, it might be it may be that they're spending a spell at a paediatric unit or um, in in the day resource that the the um, the member of staff will be able to work with them where they are so that they can really start to build that trust with that relationship. And um, I think, yeah, it's the next slide then. I thought there was something else on that slide, but not. So then the some of the other um, elements of the model that I um, started to describe is, is, as I said, around um, purposeful activity and occupation, because we, we know that, you know, children in you know, in, in this phase of crisis, they're not what you might consider um, kind of change ready or therapy ready as such. So, you know, at this point they are they are just needing that support around them and just a bit of space, just something that they can perhaps feel good about, something that they, they might be able to enjoy. So um, so we're, we're looking at how we can link into the voluntary community sector in localities to find so, um, the appropriate activities to support those individual children. Communications is a big part of the plan, as I've already described. We need um, we need communications that have been written and produced by young people for young people, so that it's um, it's relatable. Um, we're also, as Jenny's mentioned, um, across the the adult pathway, are looking at um, crisis cafes and safe spaces. We, we're looking at, in, at something similar across for children and young people because we appreciate that needs to be a, a different environment for children to to adults. Um, and then also there is um, support that the, the model that I've described is where we're going in the next two, three years. But we appreciate that at the moment there are children who are, you know, need that support here and now, and some of them are on the paediatric units at Chesterfield and UHDB. And so we are supporting those staff who, um, you know, with some psychological input, supporting those children to get the right support whilst they're in those environments, although we know that's not, might not be the right place. Um, and um, so, so as a, as a short term offer, we are we are supporting those children where they are at this time, but but the um, the plan is that they will be able to um, get more of an offer in the community going forward. OK, so that's a bit of a whistle stop through through the model and the approach that we're taking for children and young people. So if I can move on to James, I think you're going to go through the learning disability and autism offer. Thank you, James.
Thank you, Helen. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. My name's James Lewis and I'm head of Joint Strategic Commissioning for Learning Disabilities and Autism. Um, I work for the CCG, but in a role funded across health and social care. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Jen for helping with the slides. Um, in, in putting them together, I, um, I usually have a few animations on my slide, which helps me to concentrate on, on what I'm saying at the time. So apologies if there are any technical hiccups. Um, and I also wanted to thank uh, Helen uh, for providing the, uh, the BSL content for people. That's really appreciated. Thank you, Helen. So learning disabilities and autism. Um, we as a um, health and social care and community system, uh, have developed a, a vision through um, a roadmap which looks to rebalance how care, treatment and support is delivered uh, for people with a learning disability and autism, and moving away from reactive, restrictive and intensive interventions to proactive, preventative and sustainable community-based support. This, is, this vision was driven by things that we have to do, the NHS England and the government tell us that we have to do, uh, but also the aspirations of local people, um, both those with a learning disability and autism and their families, uh, carers, advocates, but also the health and social care professionals across the system who want to see the best for the, uh, the patient service users and people that they provide uh, care and treatment for. Uh, can we move on please, Jen? Um, in doing so, we developed an idea around a, a support model um, which takes um, the various different types of support uh, that people that people get um, and chunks it up into three different tiers. Um, from the bottom of the pyramid, community and third sector support, which is about having really strong community assets available for people that they can access on a day to day basis. Um, improving statutory services. Um, so this can range from education to the NHS to social care. And then lastly, crisis and intensive services. So those services that can respond to um, people should they be in an escalating situation, um, should um, they be at risk to themselves or, or, um, or to others. And we think that if we get those three bits right, we will we will go a long way to achieving what we need to do in terms of in improving our local approach. Uh, today is focused on that um, kind of crisis and intensive end, but it's important to remember that uh, those bits at the bottom, statutory services, community third sector, can act in a preventative manner. Move us on, please, Judd. Excuse me. Oh, I've talked about these three things already. I've just included in the slide some of the examples of uh, of the things that we're doing, which I won't go into loads of detail about now. So what are we doing on that crisis and an intensive end? Well, we're expanding our local intensive support teams. Um, these these teams are in place across the country to provide crisis and intensive care in the community for people with a learning disability and autism and we've been expanding our local team so that they can provide to a to a wider cohort of people um, we're looking to commission crisis in reach and crisis accommodation services um, so these we're hoping are going to prove to be a appropriate alternative to somebody being admitted as an inpatient, for example. And this would see us have a um, set of staff highly trained and skilled with experience of working with learning disability uh, and autism who can go into either people's homes or or should a person need to go into a different environment, into a residential care setting to provide people with uh, short term support uh, whilst we address what the long term changes uh, may be required to keep that person safe and well in their local community. Uh, we've been making really good connections with the Suicide Prevention Partnership. Um, suicide ideation completion disproportionately affects people who are autistic um, and by extension uh, their families, carers and everybody who knows them. Um, so we've been making, um, forming the relationships and the connections that we need with the Suicide Prevention Partnership to make sure that all the work that they're doing um, is relevant and accessible for people who are autistic and their families and carers. And then lastly, and really importantly, um, all the things that colleagues have talked about today, so from crisis cafes onwards, uh, we're 
trying to positively influence to make sure that they are learning disability and autism accessible um to be inclusive in everything that we're doing um that, that's a really important step and actually can be really important and um and and require a significant amount of work to make the change but actually it's those types of things that they when they work all together mean that um we have a really we can we can be more confident in our in our different levels of support for people we can deliver the outcomes uh that people want from us that takes me to the end is there any further speakers no there isn't am i handing back to you jen or um. katie yeah, sorry, Jen. Can can I pick up from here from the chat box? And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, please do. And, um, Simon, I uh, don't know if you want to unmute your microphone. I know you've raised a couple of points, and obviously it's quite difficult to keep them in all in order. Would it, Simon Reddy? Would you like to just ask your question, if if that's okay? Because there were one or two things you raised. Yeah, um, I'd love to. Um, so I chair a. Uh, community hub and I'm involved in setting up in Chesterfield and I'm involved in setting up another one in Matlock at the moment um, and we're providing third sector peer support um, and uh, in Chesterfield uh, you know it's specialist community services for um, you know autism advice in the community um, and a welcome space so it's very much aligned with what you're talking about in crisis uh, support um, and also autism but what we don't have is a good relationship and a good set of referral pathways with statutory and crisis support. Um, so, you know, we walk with people for a substantial amount of time. Um, and then when things aren't going well, we can't really engage with statutory services. There's no, um, you know, ongoing relationship and referral pathway. Will we try and, you know, that triangle was lovely, um, but will we try and sort of build a um, relationship between the levels of the triangle? <laughs> Can I, yep. can I come back Not at that? So, thank, thank you very much, Simon, for your, for your comment. And I'd be interested to pick up a further conversation with you with you outside of this, because um, amongst other things, we want to increase our awareness of all the things that are available in local communities. You're absolutely right. Um, it, it's it's the um, the challenge of doing something that is easily digestible and simple, but then also reflecting all the different complexities and levels that you want to bring to things. So, yes, we we do absolutely want to make the connections between the, the tiers that we've described today. Um, and actually, in, in reality, you know, um, all of those kind of things blur together. So, you know, something that's in the community can be just as important to crisis and intensive that as it is as something that we're doing at that top end. So, yes, you're right about referral pathways. Um, I'd, I'd love to pick up a conversation with you, a uh, further conversation with you outside of this, if, if you're if you're game for that. Thank you very much. Louise, could I ask you to unmute your, to take your unmute off and put your camera on? I think you've asked a number of questions. I think it might be easier. I think the four, the sort of Helen and James, would that be all right? Yes, if I can remember them all. So right, oh. apologies, apologies if I if I miss them. I was just literally typing away as people were talking. Um, I don't think my questions were answered as people were talking, but I was, as you say, there's quite a few of them. Um, so apologies if you have answered any of any of the questions that I've written down. Um, I suppose the main kind of thrust. Sorry if I'm going a bit too fast for the lady. I'll slow down. Sorry. It's fine. Um, the main thrust that I have and from what I'm reading from other people's questions is this all sounds wonderful. This is great. Um, when's it going to happen? Who's going to be delivering it and how's it being delivered? Um, and then I suppose my questions are um, how is it going to be accessed um, by obviously people like me, families like me, children in my family um, and how does it work? Because I, I, I would assume something like this would already be in place as a parent stroke carer. Um, so how how do we get this stuff? <laughs> so I pick up there, is it referring to, to particularly the ch children's element you talk about as a parent and a carer? Uh, so well, yes, keep, so I, yeah. I am also an, an adult um, that's looking to go through uh, yeah. diagnosis an assessment for autism. I've already been diagnosed with ADHD and I'm now waiting for titration. I've been waiting 18 months. Um, so, you know, 
forgive me if I'm a little bit frustrated, um, you know, when's it going to happen and how do we access this? So for the for the children's side of yeah, things sure. that, that I was describing, yeah. if I start yeah. off with that. So the um, the children's crisis response is it's already a lot. A lot of the offer around the intensive home treatments team is already in place in mm -hmm. uh, with both our CAM services. That what we're doing is we're enhancing it. We've got that because we know that the the service isn't isn't um, you know it not able to reach as many people as, as that need it as, as possible so um what we're doing is it is a, a gradual increase of of those staffing and we are looking that staff are being recruited at at this moment in time so over the next sort of six months we should be starting to see some of that expansion um i think i think the thing is to, to understand obviously that when we're talking about that intensive crisis team it is that there's lots of a, a great graduated offer along the way before people might need that level of service. So I think there's there's something as well about you know the the various um, offers that I think in the emotional health and wellbeing website dis describes as you know various offers. And I think it's about um, also the 24/7 helpline. They that's not just for people in crisis. That is where you can ring through to there and ask you know which is the best offer you know so if it's if it's not clear or you, you, you're struggling to find the, the right place they might be able to direct you by understanding your particular um, situation. Mm -hmm. I, I think maybe some of the professionals on this will echo this um, they're actually saying that they are, they're finding it difficult to to kind of refer children and young people through um, so it, it seems a little bit odd that you're referring it back to the uh, parents and carers to kind of search through and, you know, signposting is good, don't get me wrong, um, but there, if there isn't actually anything there for people, then I don't quite see the point. Um, websites are all very good and I was actually part of, you know, looking at the Derby City Council local offer, uh, the website, and, you know, I did a few things in, in my own back with the Derby City Council, which was great to be included. But to be honest, my family frequently are in crisis, as are, as are many other families in my community, and we're not seeing these feet on the ground. We're not... We're going to our GP, we're going to our paediatricians, we're requesting ed psych assessments, we're requesting OTs, we're requesting speech and language, and they're just not there, which, you know, it, there's a national crisis. Fair enough, there's a national crisis, but this has been ongoing. Um, I think the last big DCC from the CQC and Ofsted and everybody else I think it was in 2015 I attended a meeting um, and DCC were advised that they weren't doing too well and then obviously you've had the more recent one um, where nothing seems to have changed from those documentations from 2015 so we're now what seven years on and you know you've got the likes of my family saying nothing's changed you've got the likes of the CQC and Ofsted and, you know, all these different Louise, things that not um, much has really changed. I'm really sorry, Louise, there are so many questions. It, would you mind if we pick this up either afterwards or later and we can pick it up through, it, through the chat box? Absolutely. We, I mean, looking through the chat box, there's quite a few other people yeah. that, yeah, that similar yeah, themes going on. So yeah. absolutely, of course. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, the next question came from Pat, and it was, how soon do you expect that the offer will be available to support the large numbers of young people who are ending up in acute hospitals because there is nowhere else for them to go to be supported? So I think, uh, so large number, I think it's, it's, it's understanding what we're, we're we're saying by large numbers, I guess, and um, we know that there are a, a number of children that are being seen in the paediatric hospitals. Um, as I said, the the CAMS urgent care and crisis teams are seeing increasing numbers of, of children and uh, preventing a lot of children escalating up to to needing a hospital admission. And what we have seen is, as everybody's very aware, um, sort of through the pandemic, 
services have had to reconfigure and we've found that some I know where we've got waiting lists with some of the core cams because some of those core cam staff have been supporting children in crisis. So I think the the staff and the resource you know, are are doing what they can. You know, as we're saying, you know, lots of people are very, very pushed with this. Um, um but the, there are ch children are being seen. I think, you know, as as we're hearing, there are a lot more children that need need to be seen as well. Um, the the work in the um the, the paediatric units we're, we've done a lot of work recently with um we li listening to um to parents and listening to some of our, our social care particularly um and the paediatric units we've about how those plans come together and that things were felt quite disjointed and trying to support children getting out of the paediatric units we've put in place a strategic complex case facilitator which is a new post and they they are able to kind of rise above the organisations to work across the system, if you like, and to be kind of provider agnostic and to put some challenge in. And that's been a, um, been reported to be, a, you know, quite a significant role in supporting some of those children who are in the paediatric units to help to move them to somewhere that is more appropriate and to get what we talk about this wrap around to, to build that package of support around them. So um, that's a role that we we're, we're reviewing in the next couple of months to specifically get understand the learning. But we've already acknowledged that we need to increase that capacity. So we're recruiting a second post for that because we can see how important that is. Um, but un unfortunately, we are we are seeing and I you know I hear what people are saying. We, you know, the teams are telling us all the time that you know children are, are presenting uh, with higher levels of need. You know all the you know in in the teams that that we have and you know so particularly eating disorder teams you know I, I see more and more children who are who are more poorly as well so and I think you know some of this is you know perhaps the impact of that of um, the pandemic you know of schools closing that all of that disruption has had a huge impact on our children and 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 young people and it's you know it's um, it's how we best support them through that. Thank you ever so much, Helen. Uh, I think, James, you might want to pick these up or, or also with Helen. Um, Maria said it's very important to be clear that learning disabilities and autism are seen as very separate things. And the second part of that is a lot of the problems are caused by the wait for the autism assessment. Uh, Lynn has asked this, is there anything in place to help with this? I don't know if you want to start, James, with those. Yeah, sure. I actually, um, I actually responded to Maria's uh, point in the in the chat just now, but I'll, I'll kind of, I'll, I'll say it again. I, I, I absolutely agree that um, not just different diagnoses, but every individual with a learning disability, uh, every individual with a learning disability in autism who is autistic or has another neurodiversity. Apologies, Helen, for that that might be difficult to uh, transfer through. Um, has different challenges, aspirations, things that they want to achieve in their life. So we need to design and implement services that are inclusive, accessible to all, and put person-centered approaches at the heart of their model. Um, so yeah, I absolutely agree with you. Um, on the diagnostic waiting times, um, we recognise that this is a uh, this is something that we need to address in in Derby and Derbyshire. Um, it's a complicated um, environment, uh, both in terms of what are the different types of approaches that are needed for children and adults. Uh, what's the different types of support that people might need when they seek a diagnosis at different stages of their life? And how do we work alongside various stakeholders to help people recognise um, signs, symptoms, behaviours associated with potential neurodiversity? Um, so it's going to be a bit of a half hearted answer, but we need to tackle this as a big problem. Um, there are smaller interventions that are taking place. For example, we've got a project going on in um, in innovations in the post diagnostic support pathway for adults. There's work going on in children's around um, pre diagnostic uh, triage and things like that. But we need to draw all of these things together um, and to make it a seamless pathway, uh, one that puts, like I said, people at the heart of what we're doing. 
uh, and also looks to address that long waiting times either for diagnosis itself or treatment afterwards. Um, it's a, it's a really big challenge. It's one that you should rightly bring up for us and one that the more people like yourself we bring them up, the more importance that we'll keep giving it in, in our conversations. But if you if you have any experiences and insights into it, then I'd love to have a chat about it in a bit more detail. Thank you very much. Um, Jay, I don't know if you want to ask your question because you've asked a couple in the chat box, haven't you? Um, there's a couple of things I've kind of brought up as a as a topic, not really a question. It's just I've worked with young people for about six years prior to this current role. Um, and weirdly, kind of what James was saying about the person centred approach is embedded uh, within all my other roles. And with this role, it's very heavily kind of at the forefront of it. Um, and obviously, I'm part of Mental Health Together, which kind of brings the voice of lived experience to the forefront of everything kind of we do and changing services moving forward. And I just think the the nice thing about kind of listening with this and seeing from different sides and different roles that I've done is all the young people that I've spoke to, unfortunately, when they've experienced CAMS, I've I'll be honest with you, I've never had them say anything positive, which is not very encouraging. Um, and it's usually it's usually the approach is I think what they've said to me is they find it quite clinical. Um, sometimes I don't understand what they're saying um, and they don't see the point in things. And you know what young people are like, they just like you to kind of be straight with them and say, this is why we're doing it. This is what it's like. So maybe kind of having what um, you said before, I think, uh, Helen, you said about kind of creative, you know, different approach to it. It's obviously got to be individualised by child and young person and it's definitely not kind of got to be anything to do with a Likert scale or anything like that where you're scoring yourself because that just is just not going to work with them um, and that's what I've found from experience as well. Yeah thank you. Thank you Jay. Katie can I just um, come in here if, of course. if that's all right and um, obviously we've had you know we're trying to talk through quite some detailed developments and one of the things that we are really conscious of is that we're wanting to engage as widely as possible and get people's views and input into not only how we're designing services because we're talking about a lot of transformation here but also about how well our services are providing etc and one of the things that I think we shared with everybody before this meeting but we can also share after is we've started do, trying to um be clear about the different areas of stuff we're working on and have an opportunity for people to kind of express an interest of working with us on that. Um, so we have got a number of different ways of people engaging and talking to us further about these different um, different pieces of work. So if people aren't aware of that, we'll share it after. That's not only about for people with lived experience or for people who are caring or supporting, but also for local community groups, which I think have been flagged up a number of times in the chat and also professionals to understand the different bits of development that we're all working on so i just wanted to flag that up there and be conscious i've talked quite quickly so i'm hoping helen's managed to keep up with what i was saying but um yes we'll sh we'll share that so that you can keep this dialogue going on with us because conscious that an hour having a chat's never going to be enough to really get the right input that we're wanting to achieve Thank you ever so much, Jen. We've had a question from Sarah. Tourette's syndrome seems missed often in the overlap between neuro and mental health services with nobody picking up responsibility. Often the complexity of the child cases with co-occurring ND conditions leads to a mental health crisis. So can Tourette's please be considered as a gap area? I think I think you raise a really good point there, Sarah. I think um, when we Ten, unfortunately, when we talk about neurodiversity, we often focus on autism. I think that's expanding a little bit more to ADHD, but I think you make a really valid point. We need to think about all of the different conditions and make sure that, as James says, we're actually delivering a person-centred approach to that individual, meeting the needs that they have at that time, but understanding the, co the conditions that they're living in, their family's living in. So thank you very much for flagging up, Sarah. And if, if again, if we can contact you after, and make sure that we're getting your um, knowledge and experience into the services that we're designing, that'd be really helpful. 
Thank you. And Michael, you'd got a question about um, having people in A&E departments. Do, did you want to just ask that question, just elaborate on it? Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, A&E departments are often overrun and uh, uh, people should be uh, going elsewhere, but they, there's nowhere for them to go. And when they turn up at A&E, they're not ne uh, people there, the staff, uh, don't necessarily have the skills to be able to deal with this type of patient. Could could there be somebody available uh, to help out at A&E and redirect them somewhere where it would be more suitable? Um, so I think if it's all right for me to answer that, Michael, I think that's a really good point. We are, um, a lot of the work that we've talked about in terms of developing these different offers are to help people get the right support they need before they need to, you know, they, they feel they need to go to emergency departments. Part of that work will be making sure that we've got those links to emergency departments. If people do turn up there, we can make sure that we we can help the, um, the clinical team there to know where to support pe people to get the right support. The other thing that we're doing is we're linking in um, the emergency departments to the crisis line and people with experience and knowledge so that if people do present straight away, they can have some of that support. But I think your point's well made. We know that we've got work to do and we've got lots of bits of things popping up and we need to make sure that all of these things are linked up and it, and um, wherever a person seeks help, we know that they, they can get directed to the right support that they need at that time. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's great. But do, do A&E personnel know how to contact you uh, all the time you know 24 so, 7. yeah and, that, and they're the links that we are making we are we work quite closely with um the emergency departments and as we are starting to do established services we're making them aware of the services that they can help support people get to it is an emerging picture and we have to keep reiterating all of these things but we wanted to make those stronger links going forward just like we are with primary care sitting in emergency departments right. okay thank you um, hi, can I just ask uh, if if there are any other questions, would people raise their hands? Because I'm I'm very conscious that some of them are comments, uh, which which I don't want to read out if you don't wish me to. Uh, and also, I think some of them have been answered as we've been going through. So if if you do have a question, would you would you like to raise your hand so that we can go straight over to you, Leslie? Hello, thank you very much. Um, I love the aspiration. Please don't lose it. Um, my query, I guess, is, is Derbyshire is a very long, thin county. How do we get to everybody? Or how does everybody get to these services? Um, I'm from Glossop, so I don't need to say anything else, do I really? Uh, it, Jennifer, I'll give you a quick response. Let's see. I think, I think the answer is, the service cover will be different depending on the areas but what we'll need to do is work out how how individuals get support what we won't be able to do is place kind of large centers in every single place but we will be working with those community groups to understand how we can support people in their local communities rather than expect people to travel i think um part of the work that we're doing around the community framework is to help to understand what what services need to be provided at which levels if that makes sense and obviously what we're trying to do is have all of those detailed conversations with communities to be clear about what services people think they need and what services we can realistically provide so i think you, your point is really valid. we're not geographically we're not small are we and we have got large patches of derbyshire um which is hard to travel in between so we, we do consider that when we are working with people to try and design services. Because mm, we have some very extra rural areas as well, don't we? Absolutely. <clears throat> Thank, you, Thank you, Leslie. Uh, Claire McCann, did, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Yeah, uh, a couple really. I put on the chat, is this accessible through a carer's assessment? Because I've had one or two over the years and also is it um, a service that you have to be referred to or can you just access it anyway because of your uh, circumstances? Um, 
again, Claire, I think I'll I'll start um, the response and then bring my colleagues in. I guess it depends which service you're talking about um, in terms of access to carer services. Obviously, the the responses that we're talking about as people's needs are escalating in crisis, then it, 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 what we are trying to do is, is make sure that we get the right support offer for that individual at that time. Obviously, the carer's assessment is alongside that. and We need to make sure that we link all of those bits in. Were you meaning specific types of services that we've talked through today or more general? Uh, probably more general because this is the first time I've heard about this service so it's right. all very new to me um, so obviously you've given me a lot of information to <laughs> to get my head round yeah. um, but I think for me it's probably more of a general um, service I mean that there, there has been times when I think I could have accessed it in more uh, depth mm -hmm. um, but at the moment, it's I think for me, it's just having been made aware of it because I've not been, you know, I've not known about yeah. it. Um, and obviously, being a carer, you want all the support there is out there and you don't want to have to go looking for it, you know. Um, so it, it's just basically how to access it and, and exactly what you offer. I guess. Um, so I suppose the quick answer to that is in terms of a number of the services that we've talked about today, they are open access. So things like the helpline is an open access service that you can phone up if you're wanting to get some advice and support. Some of the other crisis response teams are more making sure that some, if somebody's already in a service and, is a, and their needs are increasing, then how they will get that more intensive support. I think one of the main things that we want to do when we design services with um, communities in, and individuals is discuss that bit around actually how do you get access, how do you get in, um, which, you know, which routes do we want to make sure that people don't have to jump through hurdles to get to, and which is about yeah. an escalation of support. Jenny, was there anything you wanted to bring in from the kind of crisis or safe haven side? Sorry, I was just looking at the chat there and responding to a number of comments around the geographical issues. So just to say, yeah, well, what we are looking at is is very much that open access offer. So, uh, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, we need to work through. I'm just responding. Sorry if I'm not responding to the, the exact point there. It's because I'm distracted by just a bit of a conversation about geographical spread and how we manage those issues about rurality, whether it be mobile uh, resources or virtual offer, etc. Uh, I'm just going to see if we can just squeeze two in. Natalie, did you want to unmute your microphone? I know you had your hand up quite a while ago. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for ha having me. That's OK. Um, so I work with uh, young adults primarily, um, sort of within a sixth form setting within a college. And of course, as you can imagine, uh, mental health sort of blossomed and gone into its own over the last sort of uh, five, six months. Uh, I'm interested in, of course, it being about that dialogue um, and I'm on, absolutely on the understanding that active listening and sort of communication is vital in this respect. What I'm most interested in is um, in terms of like the tailored support and the different levels, because if I'm I'm sort of speaking with a learner um, and we're talking about what that what that care or what that additional support might look like for them, that is often needs to be tailored and when you talk about it being tailored then they're going to have a positive approach to it because if it's if it is generic you know and, you know the case in point earlier was about cams and unfortunately so i would have to agree that a lot of the conversations i've had with students has been quite negative about cams how do we get around those conversations um would be important to know but i would like to know how we get about get around the different levels how we communicate that with learners and young people so it seems specific enough. So it seems individual enough, even at that level of communication. Is that OK? Yes, yeah, really good, really good point. And some, something that um, colleagues, particularly sort of linking in with education, spend a lot of time kind of trying, trying to kind of work through and having those conversations. Um, I'm not, not sure whether you're familiar with the health school approach, if that's something that, that you've, you've that is spreading across across Derbyshire, and um, I think that it's you get, get a lot of feedback that there are schools and colleges that are starting to use that kind of framework to really look at themselves as an individual organisation and the resources that they have, have and and how to build their own pathway and that 
graduated response and offer that's suitable for you know their locality, their environment, their their, their children. So there's a lot of a lot of resources that link to that. Um, there's recently as well linked to the whole school approach um, a, a a pathway that was um, it was just launched in De in December, and I can make sure you get a copy a copy of it. Where again the pathway of resources and how how schools can build. The, those resources and those connections because um, I think you know as you, as you say it's very you know there's so so much that you know the kind of trusted adults and the people around the child can cannot offer it's not we're not looking for children to be referred to services we want you know we want to support the people around the child to be able to support the child and so there's a, you know, a lot of training around sort of trauma informed support and positive behaviour support and all, all those sorts of, you know, and it's how we how we support our um, the, that, that whole community to be able to support our, our children. Helen, I'm, I'm going to have to stop you there because you. Mandy has had her virtual hand up forever. So I, I, I do wonder, Mandy, if I can just very quickly bring you in to ask you a question, which I know will be a short one. Is that OK? Because we are on the three o'clock. OK, thank, thanks thank very you. much. All it is, it's been really, really very interesting. I'm aware that the um, the, the title was supporting uh, services, supporting people with mental health illnesses. So one of my questions is, is it the difficulties we've had supporting adults as well? Secondly, or was it just mainly for children? I work in a head injury team so a neurological service where we see more and more um, adolescents so we'll see people from 16 and above and we've got some that have come in with severe very severe uh, mental health issues that um, we cannot we cannot deal with we can't eke out the mental health stuff to cognitively um, rehabilitate somebody and we've had some very close shaves with um, violence um, not actually physical but threatening violence we're really struggling to get cams involved cams don't want to know um, and we're just gonna actually have to not be able to treat this chappy in an outpatient setting because the risks are too great um, even the, is it the RISE team, the crisis intervention team for CAMS are struggling with this one particular patient we've got. And it, it's just that, it's that frustration that we we want to support, we want to help. And along with the adults, we cannot get them, we cannot get people past the assessment stage. With a lot of them, they see the head injury and say, no, it's not us. And our team is being swallowed up by a lot of time being spent on things that we can't really do because we've got no one to pass any of these patients on to for the support that they actually really need. Thank you ever so much, Mary. I'm just going to stop you there just to allow them to do a brief response. Is that Thank OK? Because I'm you. sorry, Mandy, to cut you off. I <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Mandy, you raise you know really really important point, and you know I can hear hear that kind of frustration, and I think you know to be honest, it's it's not something that's been raised with me before. To be honest, I don't think you know that particular link with with head injury. So I think you know there's clearly something there that we need to explore, um, and you know. You've, you've got the email address. I'm happy for you to, you know, contact Thank us you. You. so we can explore that further. I think we need to understand what's happening, don't we, with that? Yeah, you've got you. three or four very stressed clinicians <laughs> that we're be grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you ever so much. Can I just say thank you to all our presenters today? I'm sure you can imagine that they are all quite busy at the moment. So thank you very much for joining us. I know a lot of people have had to drop off, but um, you know, I've said how much they've enjoyed the session. I'm thinking that that means that you people may need to come back and do another one quite soon in the future to cover off things, but I'm just putting that out there. I just want to say thank you very much to everybody who's joined today. I'm so sorry we've not got to all your questions. I promise you that we do get them. 
It's a live recording. We'll go through all the questions will be up there with the answers to them, the comments. It's great that some of you have made connections just to say for those people who got the slide set, you will see that there is an a, what we call an active survey that you could participate in around. I don't, Helen, I don't know if you do or Jenny, did you want to just give a very brief Jen on the, on, on the survey that's open currently? Um, yes, yeah, so we actually have an um, open consultation at the moment. One of the things I haven't discussed today, which is a, a major thing that we've got going on across mental health services, is that we are looking to improve the inpatient environments we've got. And we're actually looking to see where we can uh, potentially build new wards and maybe relocate some wards. So we've got an open consultation and I'd really, really welcome people um, it, to have a look at that and give us their views on that. Um, the other thing, and I hope everybody got it with the presentation, was that email address to contact us and continue with these conversations because all of the people that you've met today would be very keen to co continue with that. And I'd love it, Katie, if we could get the distribution list of people who've joined today so that we could keep people informed with stuff that we've got going on. Um, I think that would be really, really good because there's been a lot of interest really in everything that's going on. And, and I know we're keen to keep that dialogue going. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think it means you're coming back fairly soon to a showroom <laughs> near you. So there we go. So again, thank you so much. We'll answer everything. Thank you for giving up your time this afternoon. We really, really appreciate it. The next session is on the 23rd of February, and that's about the voluntary and community sector in Derbyshire and how it works and will we'll work with the integrated care system as that moves on. So we'll send more information out about that. And the session on the 30th of March is from the cancer services team who are keen to talk to you about their area of work so we look forward to seeing you all in february enjoy your weekend thank you for joining us and uh, we hope to see you soon thank you very much bye bye thank you. thanks bye thank you